Good morning. It's good to see you. Next Sunday, we're going to have a baptism during this service, so I just want to put that in front of you. It'll, the service might go a little long, uh, but it's worth it. Um, so I, there'll be three or four people being baptized on the front end of this message, or a service next Sunday. So please, uh, it's probably worth showing up during the fellowship time to you know, get your seat, grab a donut. Um, maybe your customary leisureliness might not work to your advantage next Sunday. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, and there will also be a baptism in September. So if, if you're kind of thinking of baptism or considering it, um, I just want to let you know where you can, maybe what you can direct your consideration for is there'll be an opportunity in September to come forward. Well, if you uh, don't mind opening your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8. First Samuel chapter 8. At the end of the service today, I would like to, uh, for us to pray for um, what's happening in Egypt. So I'll, I did it in the front. I'm going to wait till the end. So I just want to let you know that we'll close with special prayer for not just our brothers and sisters in Christ in Egypt, but that Christ's name might be great in Egypt among all Egyptians. Um, but for now... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8, which is page uh, 199. And if you're using one of the Bibles we have provided for you. And I'll, I'll, I guess I'll begin uh, by, by just, here's a confession of a pastor. When I was a boy, I was a liar. Uh, which is different than a child who lies. I was a liar which means I lied as a, as a way of getting through the day. I don't even know if you all... Parents, uh, parents are smarter, but... Uh, so maybe you knew. I, I've never told them. I was a liar. <laughs> Forgive me. And when we moved... Uh, I never liked going to school when I was little, but when we moved to Delaware, I didn't adjust well, and so I disliked it all the more primarily because they had books at school and because there were numbers. And I did not like books and I did not like numbers, which is bizarre because it turns out I'm pretty good at math and I like to read. But at the time in my life, I did not like them. And so I would avoid school if given the opportunity. And being a liar, I created opportunities. And the best way to do that, the best way to skip school if you're a liar is to have a common cold. Because you can take, you, know, you always want to start with something that's a little bit true. It's, don't be a liar, but if you were, this is just a rule of the road. You try to take something that's true-ish and really build on it. And so I was, uh, man, I'm, sh I'm, a, I'm telling you with some humor, but um, it was pretty bad in my heart. You know... You know how I was, I was, it was dealt with. It was a classmate of mine at lunch. I was at HB Middle School at lunch, and a friend of mine, his name was Doug, he said, you know, you always lie. He just called me out. I'll never forget that. It was the Lord encountered me then. It was, it was like when everything died away, it was like the Lord saying, you know, you was right. And that changed me. I'd say that. It's nothing to do with the sermon except the, the power of, of a peer confrontation. This discipleship is what it was. It was a discipleship in the sixth grade. A friend coming to me saying, you're always lying. You should talk to a friend sometime, maybe. Um, family can't do it because the family has to love each other and all that stuff. Sometimes a friend can... But anyway, I would, I would create a lie to stay home from school, and the reason I would give was not really the reason. The real reason was I didn't have a lot of friends, I didn't like books, and I didn't like numbers at the time. There was really nothing that school had to offer me, so I thought. And so then I would make something about my health. Well, today, I'm telling you that because today, the people... The people of God, if such a thing can be said in this chapter, that's a hard thing to say in 1 Samuel 8, the people of God. But the people of God are going to ask for a king. 
And they're going to give a reason, and the reason ain't the reason. It's what they're saying, but it's not what's motivating them. And so that's what we're looking at. We're in a new sermon series. Uh, The sermon series is, is on King Saul. So for the next four or five weeks, we'll be studying the man King Saul, who is the first king of the Hebrews. But there's something that's more significant. King Saul is the man, but underneath is a deeper story about how the Israelites took one more step towards abandoning God's lordship in their life and trying to seek um, answers to life somewhere else. And that's really what we're going to look at this morning. The the question really we're looking at this morning is, is, how do we fence God out of areas in our life and look to secular, when I say secular, I don't mean it in a social way, just non-religious answers to our problems. That's really at the heart of of what we're going to be looking at. So before we read, let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, I don't want to assume that everybody, you know, even knew how to find 1 Samuel. So Here's how the, the Hebrew people were established. When, when the Lord took them out of Egypt with Moses, and then they wandered for 40 years, and then when Moses handed the reins off to Joshua as the Hebrew people came into the promised land, after you know clearing the promised land out and taking it for themselves had been complete, they settled down. And, and this is typically the way that uh, the, Hebrew, the Hebrew family or culture was organized. It was very, very, very decentralized. It was, it was not monolithic in, in any way. In fact, today you're going to see that all the elders of Israel gather to ask for a king. The last time we find that in Scripture was in the book of Deuteronomy with Moses. It gives you the impression that three, four hundred years have passed at, before they've gathered as one. But in reality, they would go live in their towns, and the Deuteronomy appoints, this is how it should work, is in each town, make sure there's a priest and make sure there's a judge. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. There should be judges and priests in the towns for the people. In other words, the priest is dealing with the vertical relationship of the people to God. They'd come to the priest, and he would mediate between the Lord and them. And the judge is dealing with that horizontal relationship between people with justice, righteousness, those sorts of things. And that's how it went. And then what happens is the book of Judges describes very well. It says something like this. When Joshua had died, there grew up to be a generation who neither knew the Lord nor remembered what he had done. The story that's being told is that that God's, God's truth was not being passed down from generation to generation. Ultimately, when Joshua had died, people did not parent well. And they didn't pass the story and the truth of God down in a way that was received by the next generation. And so there came a time when the Hebrew people essentially became to slowly become just regular people. It says there's this key phrase, judges, the theme of judges, that everybody did what seemed right in their own mind. That is like the header of judges. It's It's a verse. And so what the Lord would do is the Lord would raise up some other tribe, a nuisance tribe, some, some pain, some um, discomfort in the life of the Hebrew people, he would raise up, and that would cause the Hebrew people to repent. They'd say, why, why are we being assaulted by the Philistines or by the Ammonites or the Hittites or whoever it is? Why are we being assaulted by them? They would be reminded of the promises God had made and that they weren't keeping them. They would repent, confess. The Lord would then raise up a judge, typically a local regional judge, who would loose the bonds of oppression, give them peace and freedom. Everything was great. The judge would die. The people would forget. They'd get wicked. God would raise up, uh, you know, Ammonites. The Ammonites would oppress. They'd cry out. God would raise the judge. There's peace. Everybody's happy. The judge dies. And on and on it would go. And the story of Judges in the book of Judges shows that this cycle went on and on, but not simply that. It actually got worse and worse and worse. So the cycle of repentance and confession got more and more sluggish among the people. We arrive at last at Samuel, who is essentially the last judge, the last real judge. 
And the people are pretty much going to decide that I th they think they're done with that type of divine governance. Let's read and see what he says. Let's, let's read 1 Samuel 8, verses 1 to 5. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Okay, this is the reason they give. Okay, this is the reason that the Hebrew people give, but they've, they've, they've kind of shown their hand a little bit. This phrase, like all the nations, uh, should, should flag uh, a reader of Scripture because if, we, if you know anything about what God was trying to do with the Hebrew people, it has nothing to do with him trying to make them like other nations. In fact, it was quite the opposite. God was working hard to make the Hebrew people, unlike the other nations, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy. That's Leviticus. If we might say if the theme of the law is be holy and the theme of judges as everybody did what was right in their own mind, the theme of kings is like other nations. There's this inclination of the people's heart to become like the other nations and, and that is exactly not what the Lord was endeavoring to do. But the reason they give is different. What's the reason they give? Samuel's old and his sons are losers. That's what they say. Samuel, you had a good run. There's just no gas left in the tank, Samuel. And your boys. They're just not cutting it. What we need is a king. That's the answer they give. But let's see what the real reason is. Let's read 6 through 9. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. It says that Samuel was displeased. You can imagine that he took it personally, which is understandable because they said, Samuel, you're old. Your sons are losers. Give I mean, imagine it. You're the judge. Your job is to judge. And they come to you, they say you're old, they say your children aren't qualified, and they say, can you give us a king to judge us? So obviously you can imagine Samuel's hurt, like personally hurt. He takes his hurt to the Lord in prayer, and the Lord says, listen, Samuel, don't be hurt. It's, they're really just, they're saying it to you, but they're getting to me. He's saying, I'm the one they've rejected, don't you see, Samuel? I'm the one. It is, it's personal. It's just divinely personal. This is really about the Lord and the people. He's saying, Samuel, you're the reason they're giving, but you're not the motivation. You're not the real reason. The real reason is they are no longer content with my jurisdiction as God. They don't like my ways. They don't want me as their king. I mean, you gotta, you gotta remember, they're not asking simply for a king. God is their king. 
Even already in the scriptures, he's been named as the king. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. He sits in the throne room. But they're not simply asking for a king. They're saying, what we're asking is, is that God would not be our king and that we could have a human king. That's how the Lord hears it. God is saying, Samuel, they've rejected me. It may not be immediately easy to see that here in the text, that they have rejected him. But what the Lord does is he points Samuel to the history. He says, listen, Samuel, they've done this to me since the day I took him out of Egypt. Ever since from the first day of the first year, what I called them like my people and brought them up out of Egypt and rescued them with my strong right arm from that day, they have been wayward in their heart. They have desired to, to guide their life through something else besides me. That's what, that's what the Lord is saying here. He's saying, Samuel, they've always rejected my jurisdiction in their affairs. And I want to pause here a little bit because it's, so at some level this is history. Right? It happened and it happened 3,000 years ago, but at another level, this is, this is how, how we are. I say that it, it, when, when a problem arises in our life, whether it's a health problem or a job problem or a person, relational problem, you know, whatever it is, the immediate, our, our knee-jerk reaction when a problem arises, for them it's Philistines and Ammonites and Amalekites, right? In the next four chapters, King Saul is going to fight Philistines, Ammonites, and Amalekites. So for them, it's, it's this issue of security and, and oppression. But whenever something like this rises in our life, our knee-jerk reaction is to deal immediately with the pain. If you just allow yourself to be yourself, take the spirit out of you, you are a pain-oriented person. Meaning when pain comes on, the number one thing for you to do is to get rid of pain. That's how, that's how we behave. It's, it's our knee-jerk reaction. And in fact, we need the spirit at work in us to understand it any other way. In other words, when pain comes on, our, ugh, we, we don't want the pain. And then we remind ourselves that the Lord uses hardship to develop in us goodness. Consider pure joy, my brethren, when you experience trials and persecutions of all kinds. Because he loves you. And he's growing you. That's true. But we require the spirit to embrace that. And so what happens is pain comes on. We want to reject it, right? And unless the spirit is at work in us, we see the pain as the problem. We see that oppression as the problem or we see the problem as the problem. Where the reality is, is the problem is very often not the problem. The problem is much deeper and the Lord is using something to get at that, just like the cycle of Judges. Why were there Philistines, Ammonites, and Amalekites? Because the people were wicked. And the Lord was raising them up to foster in the life of the people a spirit of repentance and confession. He was using the Philistines to turn the people back to him. Instead, what they said is, this is really not working for us. The problem is the Philistines. God is saying, no, the problem's not the Philistines. My, in my mercy, I have given you the Philistines as a gift to make you repentant. The worst possible thing would be for me just to get rid of the Philistines. But in the mind of the people at this point, the problem is the Philistines. Now, if we just go like one step deeper here is, here, this is a notion, is, that's true, is God, is, God is, I, he's always practical. If anything's practical, practical is God. But God is not always practical in our eyes. In other words, when there's hardship in our life and God is at work, we often cannot see what God is trying to work on, nor can we see what he's doing in our life. So it feels like he's not being very practical. 
What he's doing is working on something far more profound that's in us. But this is where I think Satan makes, makes most of his stock in our life. Satan is profoundly pragmatic. Meaning, Satan knows your knee-jerk reaction to pain is to try to eliminate the pain. And that's how he comes to us. All forms of idolatry around us in our lives are rush in to deal with issues of pain. In other words, when we, Satan is monopolizing on our impatience with God's careful work. And he rushes in to just try to alleviate the pain. That's how, that's, 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 he's com so pragmatic. He, he just brokers simple fixes in our lives. In fact, it shows up even in the church. You've got to realize 1 Samuel 8 is not about the, the people not in God's kingdom. It's about card-carrying followers of God. At least they're saying they're followers of God, right? So this sort of thinking shows up inside the church just as much as it shows up outside the church. The promises, this idolatrous promises to care for pain or problems in our life without dealing with the deep issues of our life. This is why in churches you'll find a culture, a fix-it culture. Churches that, uh, churches that minister to everybody's felt needs. You know, marriage problems over there, children problems over there, money problems over there. We just care for what, what's your problem? Let's minister to the problem. It's not that we should be ignorant of the problem, but the culture of just problem management. It shows up even in the life of the church. Three-point sermons, topical sermons on life. You want three steps to a better prayer life? Four steps to a better marriage? It needs to be at least six steps to a healthy family? But all that sort of, that mentality, that mentality of, oh, the problem is really your marriage. That's really the problem. Because that's where the pain, right? You're getting feedback. The pain is here. This is what hurts. But the kind of the weak approach of saying, oh, okay, well, if that's where the pain is, let's just give you three steps. Take two of these and call me in the morning. Go, and, and that'll fix. So the Lord is trying to work on something. Why is your marriage suffering? That is a much deeper question. Why won't your daughter talk to you? Why were you fired? Those questions. See, Satan says, I won't ask you those. I'll just fix the pain. I'm going to make a comment about culture. Uh, but it obviously gets personal, so just trust that I'm trying to comment on culture. Um, I, I don't, I'm not judging any particular case here, but the cultural phenomenon of medicating pain in this generation is unbelievable. There used to be such a thing as naughty boys. It seems like they're all diagnosed with ADHD now. I mean, to me, I feel like we are, we are medicating a problem rather than dealing with it. Now, I understand ADHD exists. I understand depression exists. I understand I, I believe in the right functional use of medicine. Uh, please hear me. I'm just saying, can we step back and see the cultural reality? Which is Satan offering a substitute that deals with pain in so many different ways rather than allowing us to bow to the Lord and, and say, this pain is to take me deep and work on something that I cannot fully even understand. I'll give you an example or uh, something to think about. A little more lighthearted, I guess. My, my wife is watching Downton Abbey. I sit with her. 
<laughs> but I'm thinking of hunting grizzly bears. I'm not really paying attention. Or P90X or something. I don't really watch that. No, no, we, we're in season three, so don't tell us anything. All right? Uh, and we're, we're still going to watch the next episode tonight for her. But... <laughs> So if you don't know Downton Abbey, it's kind of a turn of the century, early 20th century, uh, waning of the aristocracy, guiding light drama that's better than that with good costumes. That's essentially what it is. <clears throat> and in the beginning of Downton Abbey, in the, when they're playing the song, you know the song? It starts off, you see like a dog's butt go off and they play the credits and everything. And it gets to the point where they have a little bell on the servants' quarters. It's on a coil. And it's the kind of thing, remember Cinderella, you could pull a rope way up in your castle and way down in the dungeon, you know, bing, 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 and then some servant would have to rush up to deal with your problem. They have one of those. It's so cool. You know, the bell rings and they rush off. Well, imagine, just I want you to imagine that God gave you a rope to pull. You have problems in your life? Pull the rope. Problem will go away. So God gives you the rope, but he says to you, but I have brought the problems into your life to make you something new. How long are you going to go before you yank that thing? The problem's there, right? When the pain hits, how long are you going to go before you cry? This is why God has not given us a rope, by the way. Because we only have, you know, uh, bling, bling. the reality is, in, in fact, this is what I see. Hardship hits somebody, you know, and, and I'll visit with them. They lost a job or something like that. And, and there's always the immediate crisis because our knee-jerk reaction is, Pain, and so we're dealing with pain. That's like the first couple weeks, and then the next couple weeks to a month, there is the where the Lord reminds us that we're spiritual people, that we love Him, that He has a plan for us. And this, usually, this by the back end of month one, is a moment of great spiritual awareness of the person. If he's, if the person's in Christ, they're very spiritually aware. They're like, I know I'm here for a reason. I'm here to learn from the Lord, and the Lord has something He wants to show me about Him. I know He'll take care of me. They say all the right things, and it's beautiful, and it's encouraging. Then in month two, they learn 13 things, 12 things about themselves. Boy, they have learned. So they're ready for the problem to be gone. The reality is, it's like a scavenger hunt to learn about yourself to get the problem gone. Like, the Lord wants me to learn about myself, and so you root out, oh, okay, I'm selfish. You pull the rope. But nothing it doesn't solve itself. And so I, I see this the shock of a problem, and then I'm spiritual, I'm in Christ, and then God wants to teach me, and then this kind of mad dash to learn what the Lord has to teach you, so that what? All right, God, now you can end the problem. It's still problem management. To which, because there is no rope, a person doesn't get a job for seven months later. Because what the Lord wants to do is deep. And it's not going to happen until you, in some cases, are broken before him with nothing. And then he can truly teach. That is what God is doing with the Philistines, the Ammonites, and the Hittites, and all the ites in the lives of the people with the judges. That is what they want to stop. And this is what's happening is they're saying to, to Samuel, Samuel, just give us a king, a king that will fight our battles for us, the ones we want, a king that will manage our pain so that we can have the life we want. That's what they're asking for. And, and the Lord says, this is who they are. Give them what they want, right? This is the Lord handing us over. Give them what they want. But warn them, Samuel. Tell them exactly what they're going to get. And so this is what Samuel, Samuel says. Verse 10, so Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots 
and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you will be his slaves. And in the day you cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's the warning Samuel gives the people. Now, if you are, uh, if you're familiar with addiction, uh, you're familiar with this passage. This is, this is idolatry. This is classic idolatry. Idolatry, it costs you more than you intend to pay. It gives you less than you hoped it would, and it lingers and festers far longer than you had planned. That's what's happening here. What, what the Lord is saying is when you deal with, when you try to deal with problems apart from the Lord, that's idolatry. Any effort to experience victory in life apart from God is some form of idolatry. And here, they have an idolatrous desire for a king, a king who will fight their fights for them, who will battle them, who will be like all the other nations. They want someone who will deal with the things that are on their heart. And what's on their heart is pain, the, the, the discomfort in life. And, and the Lord's saying that any effort to do that, if all you're going to do is minister to this pain, you will not ultimately get healthier. You will simply exchange it for some other form of slavery. You're oppressed here. If that's what you minister, work and labor towards, you'll exchange it here. It's like, you know, you're holding a weight in your left arm and your arm's getting tired and it's starting to shake and it's starting to shake and it's starting to shake. Idolatry is grabbing it with your right arm. You didn't solve the problem. You've just affected another side of your life. You've momentarily alleviated with a myth. But you've only exchanged. That's what he's saying here. He's saying, you think you want a king. You're going to get a king who's going to presume to fight your battles, but will cost you your life. Anything less than God is an exchange of one problem for another. This is the response of the people. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. This is verse 19. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice, make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. This no is, is so rebellious. This is the difference between idolatry and the Lord. The Lord fights for us. Meaning the Lord knows what's right for us, what's good for us the best for us, and he fights for us. Idols fight our battles for us. That's the difference. We choose, and with idolatry, the things we want to deal with, which may or may not be for our good. But the Lord fights for us. And this is, they want, they want a king who will fight their battles for them. When I, read, when I read this no, it, it vaulted me into the New Testament, you know, about the issue of a king when they, you know. 
Samuel saying, cannot the Lord be your king? No. It, it was just springboarded me and made me think immediately of John 18 and 19, where Jesus is brought before Pontius Pilate under the accusation that this man is claiming to be the king of the Jews. Which was something that the Hebrew people both longed for and rejected in Christ. He's not our kind of king. That was the, that was the visceral Pontius Pilate. Do you want him back? No, we don't want him back. I find no charge against him. Look, I release somebody. It's a tradition. I'll release him on the Passover. No. We have no king but Caesar. If God is our king, we have to trust that he's going to fight for us. Work on the deep issues. I'm not saying that we learn to love pain or that we don't, we're not wise. We're, you know, but we trust the Lord. The telltale identifier of someone who's fleeing from God is someone who is simply interested in dealing with the problems they have at hand. I'll close with this. This is a good way for you to diagnose yourself, maybe. Think of your problem, whatever it is. If I were to say to you, if I were to tell the story of the cross, Christ, would you in your mind say this? I'm not saying you would publicly say it. But in your mind, would you, would you say, what does the gospel have to do with my problem? That's a sign that you're on the verge of idolatry. That you don't see what Christ has done as being intimately connected to what's wrong in your life. You know, last week we talked about the narrow and deep promises of God that God has promised to care for us. Those who are in Christ, that God has promised to care for us across death into new life. That there is no problem on this earth that defeats that promise. How is that not related? The promise that God uses will not leave you in hardship. No matter what happens, he will remain with you and work on you. How is that not related to your problem? The promise that God is committed to making you a new creation, that he will run the race with you and make you something new. Therefore, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your spiritual act of worship. We read that this morning. That promise that, that God wants to work and craft in us to become a new person, more like him, it made in his image, to be born again in his image, that that is done through hardship. How are those things not related to your problem? But in your mind, if you have a challenge and the gospel is a million miles away from it, if you just tell me what to do to make the pain go away, that's a sign. That you want a king like the other nations. I'm thankful that the Lord remains our king. That he even sent Christ as a king. That is... I mean, the next several weeks, we're going to watch how God salvages us. He goes on a salvaging expedition to rescue us, even from our own poor decisions. He hasn't left us simply to wallow in idolatry, but he continues to rescue us. The question this morning is, who, which king are you serving? Let me pray, and as I do, I'm going to transition uh, to the crisis in Egypt. I encourage you to pray with me. Lord, Lord, I do pray even a spirit of gentleness would fall on the shoulders of those in this room who are plagued by a problem. Lord, it feels like your word has a hard truth but behind it is this wonderful, gentle truth that your spirit works in us for our good. Lord, I think people just need to be reminded of that. 
ever reminded of that, Lord. I just pray now that you would impress on them that you're there, that their problem is small compared to your promise. Lord, if it's addiction or habitual idolatry, Lord, I pray that you would likewise remind the person that you're there and that what they're doing is unhealthy. What they're doing is avoiding the deep work that you desire to do in them. Lord, show up as a stern friend to that person. Lord, even to those who don't have a problem right now, they don't have a problem, but they they don't have a habit of turning to you either, Lord. I pray that you would show yourself again to them. Challenge them, Lord, as to who, who are they looking to. Lord, we confess that through Christ we have the right and obligation to be a people of hope because you've done such good for us. And you call us to confess your son as the king of kings, which means that we have the obligation and the great hope to look to him in our problems. And Lord, we take this prayer and we turn it now to our brothers and sisters in Christ across the sea, who even now, Lord, I, I read of burning churches and of persecution. Lord, we start with those who are in Christ. Lord, we pray that you would have your way with them, Lord, and that they would make you look good and holy in this time of crisis. Lord, it seems inappropriate to turn and just pray that the problem would go away for them, Lord, after knowing that you have a purpose in these, in these times. So, Lord, we pray that you would make them steadfast in their faith, to grow them in the knowledge of God, to strengthen their faith and their testimony. Lord, we pray that the many in Egypt around these people, that if they could see their faithful witness of them loving their enemies, praying for those who persecute them, displaying forgiveness, not falling into fearfulness. Lord, if, when they see these things, Lord, I pray they would be drawn to the message of Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray that out of this might come opportunity for revival and for salvation and for the growth of your church. Lord, and then at the end of all of that, we ask him to the degree that it can be done without physical harm, Lord, we pray that might happen. Lord, be with us and all of your people, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Would you stand, please, and I'll pray a blessing over us as we go on our way. Weather permitting tonight, 6 to 8, at Woodside Creamery. It's not formal. It's just show up and eat ice cream. And if I have to linger and visit so that I have to get two ice creams, I will do that for you. Uh, let's pray. May the Lord bless us and keep us. Let his face shine upon us. May you always, Father, be king over us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.